From the Radio Cafe and the Kivira Coalition, you're listening to Down to Earth, the Planet to Plate podcast. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domandi. This is a program about regenerative agriculture, and today we're going to be talking about some amazing regeneration that's happening in the waters of the Atlantic Ocean. That's right after these brief announcements. This program is sponsored by Shine, a pet food company that features over 40 organic, fresh dog and cat food recipes that give your animals delicious and balanced meals. Shine uses responsibly sourced ingredients and earth-friendly packaging, and they're a certified B Corporation, which means that they meet the highest social and environmental standards. My own dogs eat Shine pet food, and they love it, even my very finicky dog, Curly. Shine has stores in Santa Fe, Boulder, and Denver, and you can order online from anywhere at shine.pet. This program is sponsored by the Agrarian Trust. Agrarian Trust is charting a new path forward for the land trust movement. They're advancing an innovative and robust model of land ownership in which agrarianism, social and environmental justice, community well-being, and the earth itself are all seen as fundamentally intertwined. They're doing this by helping regenerative farmers and ranchers to secure long-term affordable leases. That helps to strengthen local food systems and to transform community relationships to the land across the country. Visit agrariantrust.org to learn more. This program is sponsored by the Greenhorns. Listeners to Down to Earth might enjoy the newly released 6th edition of the New Farmer's Almanac, a literary miscellany written by and for working agrarians. This year's volume is titled Adjustments and Accommodations, and it's full of essays, poetry, and images that explore how people are facing challenges and uncertainties on the land. Learn more and order your copy at greenhorns.org. And we want to let you know that the Regenerate 2023 conference is coming to Santa Fe this November 1st through 3rd. If you are interested in learning more, buying tickets, or even becoming a sponsor, please head to regenerateconference.com. And before our program today, I want to bring you a special feature. It's a short interview with one of our sponsors, The Good Meat Project, and their executive director, Michelle Thorne, who is a farmer, a podcast host, an artist, a business person. And I caught up with her recently to talk about good meats for summer grilling. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Now, you're the director of The Good Meat Project, and as the 4th of July is coming up and people are going to be grilling... We want to give people an idea about how to shop for meat that's going to be good for their health, good for the farmer, good for the planet. What is good meat to you? Like, what does that term mean? Well, good meat is 100% grass-fed. It's grass-finished or pastured. It's chemical, corn, and soy-free. It's meat that's raised with best practices that take into consideration transparency, which is a really, really big one. And on the production side of things, good meat focuses on the welfare of livestock, uh, regenerative stewardship of the land and conservation resources, and also helps create economic viability for the people and families producing and selling good meat across the entire good meat value chain. On the processing side, good meat is processed closer to the farm or ranch where the animals are raised. It's processed by butchers and folks who take great care in using the whole animal and not wasting anything. And lastly, on the consumer side of things, good meat in the short term is accessible close to home and it's flavorful. And in the long term, good meat is nutritionally dense and is a part of a well-balanced life. So that's really what good meat means to me. Good meat is inevitably more expensive, unless you buy huge, huge amounts of it, but usually it's retail more expensive. Why is that? Well, that's a really nuanced question because in most cases, good meat that fits the criteria that I just described is never really going to retail at 2 or $3 a pound as you might find you know, at the grocery store coming out of the industrial food supply chain. Good meat producers can't take advantage of economies of scale. They typically are not able to take advantage of large government subsidies, you know, that help keep some of those costs competitive. Sometimes good meat is more expensive because they're processing bottlenecks. So not to mention, we're also in an inflationary cycle in general. So a lot of the inputs are more expensive and small producers 
are typically one person or small family operations, and it's just a lot of work. But I will say that it isn't always the case that good meat is more expensive. And one of the, I think, most advantageous ways to hedge the more expensive question, for consumers anyway, I'll tell you a little story. For the first time a couple of years ago, I purchased a quarter share of beef for my family. And this was during the time that ground beef was retailing at $7 a pound. Now, in that quarter beef, I got a lot of ground beef, but I also got a variety of different cuts, including things like short ribs, New York strip steaks, bottom roast, stew meat, uh, sirloin steaks, soup bones, oxtail, and flank steak. And I'll tell you, it's the best beef I've ever had. All of those different cuts were all under $7 a pound. So buying in bulk is a great way to support local producers, get a nutritious and delicious freezer full of meat that's better for your health and the land. And those are just the benefits of purchasing directly from local farmers and ranchers. So not all good meat is more expensive. Back to the 4th of July, people are out shopping and they're looking for what they're going to put on their grill, what are some of the red flags or like deceptive wording that you find on packages of meat? Well, this is a loaded question because there are a lot of confusing labels on meat in the marketplace when it comes to what it means when you're looking at your typical like food label. The terms grass-fed, pastured, free-range, farm-raised, even the word natural. And some of these terms are used on packaging and they're not synonymous, right? When we're shopping at a large chain or a big box store, in many cases, the manufacturer or processor isn't required to provide any transparency on the label. They don't have to tell you where the animal was raised, uh, how it was raised, whether it spent its entire life in a cage, or if it had access to one square foot of grass in the last week of its life just to be labeled as grass-fed. One surefire way to know exactly what you're getting in your meat is to buy from a local producer because you can verify with them. You can look a farmer or rancher in the eye and ask them about their farm and their practices. And I'll tell you, all of the farmers I know are thrilled when a potential customer asks them about the how they do what they do and how it can benefit you, the consumer. There's a saying in the good meat community that goes like, It's not the cow, it's the how. And there are a lot of folks out there who understand that good meat production focuses on how animals are raised, how land is stewarded, how workers are treated, how small businesses contribute to the local economy, and so on. You can't get any of that buying meat in a styrofoam tray wrapped in plastic. So if you can, find a farmer near you. And you can do that on our consumer-facing website, goodmeatbreakdown.org. Michelle Thorne, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. You can find out more at goodmeatproject.org and goodmeatbreakdown.org. And now to our program. I was recently in Rhode Island and got a chance to eat some fresh seafood. I'm especially fond of raw oysters and little neck clams. And when I was there this time, I learned about some folks who were doing great work farming oysters and restoring over-harvested oysters to their natural habitat. And there's also some amazing work going on using oysters to clean polluted waters. Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts is an island off the southern coast of Cape Cod, and it has a thriving seafood industry. So today we'll be talking with a scientist and an oyster farmer who are from there, Rick Carney is a shellfish biologist, and he's director emeritus of Martha's Vineyard Shellfish Group. And Alex Friedman is owner of the Snows Point Oyster Farm on Martha's Vineyard. Welcome to Down to Earth. Thank you. Nice to be here. So, Alex, let's start with you. How did you get into oyster farming? Well, I had a, uh, a background in commercial fishing, mostly offshore for tuna, swordfish, and other species, and had always had interest in recreational shell fishing, going out and gathering oysters, clams, mussels, and things just for myself and my family. And about 10 years ago, I had two young daughters born, and just on a personal note, being offshore and being dependent on weather and fish migrations and movements meant that it was very hard not only to be at home when I needed to be, but to be able to plan. 
And quite simply, there was an advertisement in the local Martha's Vineyard paper for an oyster farm that was being given up by a couple who were retiring and uh, started discussions with them. I remember asked Rick if uh, I could take him to lunch and pick his brain and spoke to a bunch of the other oyster farmers who have been really incredibly helpful. And so started that process and took over that farm and have been kind of both downscaling it and adding new equipment and just getting into it. But again, very much with the help and, and support of other farmers and other folks in the community. Rick, the Martha's Vineyard Shellfish Group is all about preserving and restoring the shellfisheries on the island of Martha's Vineyard, including oysters and other shellfish. Talk about the natural role of oysters in the coastal ecosystems that they're native to. Like, what do they eat? Who eats them? Like, who are their predators? And what is their relationship with the other aquatic species that they share the water with? Well, you know, the the longer I've studied oysters, the more I... I really appreciate how important they are to the whole picture. One of the ways to think about it is a lot of people are aware of the value of coral reefs to the tropical fisheries in terms of providing habitat for a whole bunch of different animals. And oyster reefs do the same thing in a temperate climate. So they provide all these little nooks and crannies for all kinds of other species to grow and kind of a nursery area of protection for a lot of species. So they really improve the biodiversity of a region. Then another thing that they do is they essentially are filter feeders. So, and the, the number is a little bit, you know, numbers are kicked around with how much they will filter, but anywhere from about 15 to 50 gallons a day, you know, depending on the size of the oyster and the temperature and other factors. But so they're constantly cleaning the water. So they're basically like nature's filter in the water. And they will filter the water to select their food, but also anything that they don't eat, they just wrap up in kind of a mucus and deposit it and spit it out. And it's called, technically, it's called pseudofeces. So essentially, they take the algae out of the water, but they also take a lot of particulate material that they don't eat. And they basically send it out in these little packages that get put into the bottom of the bay or the environment. And then that makes that material available for other benthic species, animals that live in the bottom, such as different worms and things like that. So they're, I mean, they're really important on so many aspects. They also, you know, especially in shallow water environments, they break the wave energy, so they protect the shore. So they're also important for erosion control. When you talk about coral reefs, and now you're talking about oyster reefs, is that what you mean? Like they're literally building physical reefs? Yeah, well, they, um, they're they gregarious species. What they tend to do is they'll settle, you know, they go through a swimming stage and they settle out. I like to tell people, think of it as like the metamorphosis of a caterpillar to a butterfly. So they go from this swimming organism, this little microscopic swimming organism, then they go through a metamorphosis and become essentially a miniature version of the adult form. And at that point, they cement to something and they prefer hard surfaces and they really are attracted to areas where other oysters are growing. So in a natural environment, what will happen is they will just create these, what they call bars or reefs, where there's this conglomeration of oysters. And again, it functions like a coral reef. And do they have any natural predators? Oh, yeah. No, everything everything eats them. I mean, when we spawn them in the hatchery, it's not unusual for us to get millions of eggs per female. I think some of the research has shown that over the course of a summer, a female can release like 165 million eggs. So if all of those were to survive, I mean, the planet would be coated with oysters, probably over what would be important and valuable. So essentially, they're food for everything. When they're very small, they're part of the plankton, different species that are also filter feeders will filter the larvae out of the water and eat them as they get older. Probably the biggest predators when they get older, our crabs are a real problem. But there are also these little snails called oyster drills. 
they'll basically drill a little hole into in the oyster and suck the meat out. Starfish can feed on them. So essentially, I mean, even fish. So they're food for everything, not only us, <laughs> the two the two legged predators. And what happens to their shells when they die in nature? They just like our habitat for new oysters? Yeah, I mean, that's the important thing with restoration projects is that oysters, essentially their habitat is, you know, the remains of the previous generations. So when oysters are harvested and the shells are not put back in the pond, we're essentially destroying the habitat. Right. So we have a, at the Shellfish Group, we have a shell recycling program and modeled after efforts everywhere. I mean, one of the most important things you can do for restoration is to make sure that you return shell to the natural environment. Right, right, right. Alex, talk about how you harvest oysters. Like, what does your farming operation look like? How do you how do you actually do it? Well, an interesting thing is that oysters are grown literally all over the world. Europe, Japan, New Zealand, East Coast of North America, West Coast of North America. And there's many different techniques for doing it that all have varying degrees of success. They range from simple bottom scattering, where you sort of take the seed, which is a small oyster from the size of a grain of a sand to a fingernail, and spread them across the bottom, let them grow for a period of time, and then either tong or dredge them up. Or there are floating cages, which is sort of a mesh bag that will hold small oysters and then keep them in a floating apparatus, which helps because there's more plankton at the surface for them to eat and the kind of wave action can help tumble them around a, a little bit. It's, it's In terms of growing an oyster, it's for market, it's good that they be jostled a little bit. It strengthens the shell and it improves the shape. Um, but my farm and due to just local regulations really is we do what's called bottom cages. So a bottom cage is basically made out of uh, coated wire mesh and has slots in it like a cabinet almost, an open cabinet. And each slot, say 10 slots, will hold a bag that has got a certain diameter mesh. And just as a round number, each bag will maybe ideally hold 100 mature oysters. And 10 of those to a rack means each cage is holding roughly a thousand oysters for market. And our farm is in about 12 to 15 feet of water, depending on the tide. And those cages will sit on the bottom. They have a small line going to the surface and a buoy, a marked buoy. And we will, using a winch, pull the whole rack up as it were and put it on to a raft and then either tend to the oysters or harvest them from there. So when you see, like, I believe it's in New Zealand, they use a very different kind of almost a, a lantern style net. But um, basically what we do is we let them rest on the bottom and they, they spend a lot of time there. And then we pull them up to see how they're doing. And when they're ready, the right size and shape, we'll um, clean them up and send them off to market. Talk about the market for oysters and what makes a good oyster? Like, is bigger better? Are there differences in flavor according to the conditions that they're in? I know it's all the same species, but are there different, like, variations of oysters for different markets? Very much so. A current term being tossed around is meroir, like terroir for grapes, if you were. And with a winery or a vineyard, Depending on the hillside, certain grapes may grow more robustly or less so. And so even though, like you said, they're all the same species genetically of oyster, the environment that they're grown in, and that includes salinity, water temperature, mineral content, the availability of, of plankton, very much affects how the oyster, the animal inside grows. But because virtually all of our uh, sales and market are for raw bars, are for shucked oysters, it's very much a presentation food. 
So we strive to have the whole shell be a certain sort of shape and size. We like what's called a deep cup. There's a top and a bottom to an oyster. In the bottom, you want sort of cupped like your hand if you were trying to scoop water. It sort of indicates a healthier and more robust oyster inside rather than a very thin and flat one. But interestingly, like if you look at oysters from France, Belons, they are very kind of wide and flat, but still grow very well. So there's not much I can do to control the flavor of the oyster. It's, it's really dependent upon where they're growing. But one thing as a grower I can affect is the shape and cleanliness of the shell. Another quick note is we are constantly battling against oyster predators, like the oyster drills that Rick had mentioned, or various sponges, various things that can affect the shell quality and therefore the marketability of the oyster. So we will oftentimes do what's called air drying, where we'll take one of those aforementioned cages with a thousand oysters in it, we'll pull it up onto the raft and let it sit in the air for two days, sometimes three days, depending on the temperature. The oyster inside survives that fine, but a lot of the things growing on the shell will die off. And the last thing in terms of size is we for many years had regulations in Massachusetts that an oyster had to be three inches to sell, and that's still kind of a standard, but now there's been a big push in the market towards what are called petites, which are two and a half inches. And my personal belief is that's from the popularity of West Coast oysters, like the Kumamoto's, which are much smaller, much deeper, again, different species, but, and maybe a smaller oyster is less intimidating to eat for a newcomer, but there's definitely been a market trend towards smaller oysters. Interesting. So smaller oysters are, you know, when you're growing them, you're just harvesting them younger? Yes, exactly. I think it's so interesting. I, oyster, I mean, there's different species of oysters on the planet, but here in the U.S. along the Atlantic seaboard, I mean, from Louisiana to Maine, they're all one species. It seems like they're a pretty resilient species. I mean, that's a lot of differences in environment and water temperature and things like that. Well, you know, it's pretty amazing. I mean, when you think of well, any of the mollusk species, they've been around for millions of years. And what's really interesting about oysters is that they live in this in these very varied environments where, you know, they're in an estuary where the salinity changes, the temperature changes. They're sometimes intertidal, so they'll be out in a lot of heat in the sun, and then the water comes in. So there's, you know, they've been over the period of time that they've been evolving, um, subjected to all kinds of stresses. And as a result, they're, they're capable of, of dealing with a lot. And, and what's interesting now, a lot of the research that's going on is attempting to see what's going to happen with climate change and all of the environmental changes that occur there. And at least some of the early information that's coming out suggests that oysters are going to do quite well because they are used to these very, very environments. What are the threats to oyster populations? I mean, I imagine over harvesting, because that's something that, that we've seen, but also disease, pollution. What are the threats to oysters as a species and to healthy populations of them? Well, you know, the Chesapeake Bay, which is kind of a, a classic case of what happened. I mean, that, that was an oyster heaven in the late 1800s and they were over harvested and the habitat was kind of destroyed because wild oysters that were harvested from the beds and you know essentially these reefs and rocks you know conglomerations of oysters were torn down in the process of, of harvesting and then on top of it what's happened is that as oysters because they they seal up so tightly they can be moved big distances and diseases, oyster diseases that don't hurt people, but are a problem for oysters, have been spread all over the place when oysters are transferred. So probably the biggest threat that, well, the growers deal with, and I think that in the natural environment, is these oyster diseases. Most of them are parasite diseases, and they can basically, you know, knock out like 80% of a population over a short period of time. So now, whenever we move oysters, 
like from the hatchery, we have to have them certified to make sure that they don't have any parasites that we could transfer to another site to cause problems. Habitat destruction and obviously pollution, those issues are also major problems. What is the cause of the parasites? I mean, is it the kind of imbalances that human beings, industrial human beings anyway, tend to cause like pollution or or warming or like why so many parasites now? Well, the parasites are there. And I think though that, you know, when a population is stressed, any population that's stressed is going to be more difficult for them to fight off a disease. Yeah. So, I mean, they're there anyway. And like I said, they because oysters have been moved around, populations that have never been exposed to a certain disease and never had a chance to develop an immunity, all of a sudden, you know, an oyster comes from somewhere else with a parasite to this site that hasn't seen the disease, and it can wreak havoc. Talk about the process of shellfish restoration. What does that look like? How do you actually do it, like on Martha's Vineyard? Well, the restoration is really pretty much putting oysters back and also improving the habitat. And also, they live in the water, and it's improving the environment, trying to make sure the water stays clean. But what we do, I mean, the major part of it is basically putting shell back. So there's some places for these oysters to settle hard surfaces for them to survive. I mean, the the little oysters, when they're plankton, when they get ready to settle down, if there's no hard surfaces, they basically will settle down in the mud and then just get buried. So it's very important to have the shell in there. So the shell recycling is is an issue. And then um, in the natural environment, the oyster spawns every year or, you know, when some years are better than others. I mean, the the oysters swim in the water. The, The swimming stage is about three weeks. And during that period of time, there can be changes in rainfall, salinity, environmental issues that will, in fact, result in a bad year. So it's not unlike, you know, crops in a field. Some some years the weather is with you and you have a really good harvest and other years you don't. So what happens is the oysters, what I've noticed on the vineyard, at least, is it, you know, will get a little bit of spawning probably every year, but it's maybe once every seven, eight, ten years that conditions are perfect and we get a really heavy set. And then the, the, you know, at least the wild fishery would depend upon that, that particular year class to, to harvest. And um, without that, um, without that, you know, eventually that gets uh, depleted. So what we do um, in the hatchery, we actually grow oysters and then release them, um, you know, on the reefs and on the on the shell. So that's probably, you know, the, the operation of the hatchery um, and seeding them is probably, you know, the other major thing that's done on top of putting the shell out to catch the natural set. And, and in the hatchery, we can control a, a lot of environmental conditions so that we can ensure that there's a good oyster spawn whenever we want it whereas in the in the natural environment conditions may change from year to year and you can't be dependent on you know getting a decent set as they call it our spat fall every year whereas in the hatchery we can do that right right alex what is the role of aquaculture farmers like oyster farmers in the process of restoration is there like a balance between making a profit and leaving enough for nature or it sounds like it's not really like that i mean what what is your what do you feel like your role is in restoration well is corollary we grow for market we're in business and the byproduct is that there are many 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 thousands hundreds of thousands of filter feeders in those areas so there's a benefit to the surrounding environment, I would say there's more of a net positive benefit than negative. We don't disturb the bottom. We're really introducing a lot of filter feeders in places where they wouldn't be otherwise. And the second part would be that now that there's more awareness and the great efforts of the shellfish group, 
that those shells ideally will be returned to the water rather than thrown into a landfill. So we're providing, I guess, benefits for the water quality in the areas where we do grow and also providing shells that can be returned for habitat restoration. If I could also add that the wild fishery, the wild population that is fished on is so much in decline that the private growers growing, you know, hatchery stock and supplying much of the market now, more of the market than the wild fishery, actually takes the pressure off the wild populations and allows them to come back, so to speak, without having so much fishing pressure on them. Another thing is that, you know, I talked a little bit about the coral reef business and the habitat. There have been studies that have shown that even though the oysters that are grown by private growers are not, you know, in a reef situation, they're grown in these cages. The cages provide similar situations as nursery habitat for different marine animals. So they function very similar to a reef. One of the things that, that I guess Alex mentioned is that if you want to get a private lease to grow oysters, it has to be determined by the state that it is an unproductive area. So by putting the oysters there, you're putting animals in that wouldn't normally be there. And then on top of it, you're creating this habitat for other species. I have to absolutely second what Rick said, and I, it slipped my mind, but in our bottom cages, they are absolutely loaded with other kinds of marine life. Everything from big striped bass to flounder to eels to blue crabs to just because it's structure and things grow on it as opposed to a flat muddy bottom, there's significantly more marine life around the farms than there would be if they weren't there. And again, they're not harmed by it whatsoever and they're, we don't harvest them. Some, you know, if a, a crab comes up, we gets tossed back in the water and we'll go find a home in, a, in the next cage. But there's many thousands of these almost mini reefs, if you will, the size of, a, of, an, of an oven or something like that, but with lots of nooks and crannies. So there's definitely, and thanks for bringing it up, Rick, there's a lot of corollary species that appreciate the habitat. Is there any qualitative difference or appreciable difference between farmed oysters and wild oysters? Are they pretty much the same thing? No, they're, they're definitely different products. And I think that's one of the things that the, I mean, the oyster growers spend a lot of tender loving care on the oysters. As Alex mentioned, they take them out to keep the shells clean. Um, many, I don't know whether Alex does it, but there's a tumbling procedure they do to create the deep cup shell. So it's a different product totally. I mean, we did a, in 1995, we had a project with some federal money here called the Private Oyster Aquaculture Initiative. And we started a training program to kind of get some of the wild fishers involved in growing their own stock. It was funding that came as a result of the fact that they had closed a lot of George's Bank to fishing because of the decline in the fish there, that the federal government had money available and said, find something for these guys to do other than fishing on, the, on George's Bank. So we pretty much proposed this program to have them grow their own, their own products. And as a result of that, you know, we had a product when it first came out that was somewhat in competition with the wild oysters. And the wild oysters are misshapen and, you know, the quality just isn't there. And the prices is, is a, a lot cheaper in the market for them because there aren't a whole lot of them. You have to pick through them to find the ones that are shaped for a raw bar. And what we had to do was, I mean, the fish markets wouldn't, they weren't interested in the cultured product because the cultured product was more expensive because it took more effort to get them to what they were, but they were essentially a different product. And we worked with the growers to try to do a marketing effort to introduce them to the population here. And there are different events, but I, I think this Taste of the Vineyard, which is a big fundraiser here in the spring, we were able to have a raw bar there and we introduced the general public to the cultured oysters by having these oyster tastings. And, you know, the fish markets up to that point weren't buying the cultured ones because they, they were too expensive. And the people at these tastings would say, well, 
you know, where can we get these? And we said, well, you go to your fish market and tell them that you want cultured oysters. And eventually the markets realized it was a different product and they were willing to pay more money for it because they could sell it for more money. And now it's really interesting to go into the markets and you'll see up on the blackboards, they'll have the variety of different oysters by different growers actually featured. So to answer your you know, question in a long way, yes, they're, they're totally different in terms of the market quality. Is anybody still harvesting and selling wild oysters? Uh, yes. But not in comparison to the private growers, it's much smaller industry. Much, much smaller. Yeah, much, much smaller. So that's kind of a win-win. I mean, oyster farmers are selling their product and habitats are being restored. Exactly. And habitats being created by the actual farms. Right, right. Very interesting. The way I heard about this whole story was the story about oysters that are being used to clean polluted water. This is happening in Chesapeake Bay, I think, in New York Harbor. As you said, they can filter remarkably large amounts of water. What kinds of pollutants can they absorb and what happens to those pollutants? Like, where do they go? Do they stay in the oyster? What does that look like? Well, when we talk about pollution, I mean, one of the things that's a real big issue for us here on the vineyard is that as the human population has increased, there's much more nitrogen that goes into the water. And nitrogen is essentially a component of fertilizer. So the more nitrogen you get, the more algae that will bloom. And the algal blooms are definitely a pollution issue. It's natural, but it's pollution. I mean, it comes from too much nitrogen getting in the water. And what's interesting is that, you know, the more nitrogen, the more algae bloom. And the oyster is being filter feeders and actually feeding on the phytoplankton, on the algae. Well, by feeding, they basically are taking the nitrogen out. I mean, nitrogen is a building block of protein. So when it's incorporated into algae, it's part of the algal proteins. And when the oysters feed on it, they basically take that algal protein and turn it into oyster protein. And then when the oysters are harvested and taken out of the pond and consumed, we are essentially taking the nitrogen out, you know, in terms of oyster shell and oyster meat, which wouldn't happen if the oysters weren't there. And again, the the algal blooms get so thick that they shade the bottom. There's a species of grass called eelgrass that's very important to the environment. And when you have too much algae, it'll actually shade the water to such a point that the eelgrass dies. And then the whole system starts to collapse. So that's one aspect. The other thing is that they do concentrate different minerals. I mean, one of the things that's really cool about oysters is that Apparently, if you can eat like, if you eat like a half a dozen or maybe, yeah, probably a half a dozen a day, you get like 500 times your zinc requirement because they do concentrate heavy metals. So they can be healthy, but in in, in a polluted environment, they will in fact concentrate, you know, other pollutants that are not healthy. So the bottom line is that you don't want to be eating oysters from a polluted environment, an area with a lot of heavy metals. But in a in a normal environment, you know, the pollution we're talking about them cleaning up is actually the algae and the algal blooms. There's places where there is PCBs, which is a terrible pollution that's in a lot of water on the East Coast, like where I grew up at the Hudson River, the water was full of PCBs. And petroleum, like oil spills, and as you said, heavy metals and things that are so toxic to humans and so toxic to the entire marine environment, can oysters, I mean, in sufficient numbers, really start to clean that stuff up, you know, and then just sort of stay on the bottom and provide habitat for the next generation of of healthy edible oysters? Over time, that's po- that's possible. I mean, PCBs and you know some of these like these forever chemicals that you're talking about now. Those are you know it's 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 a difficult issue. And the bottom line is, I mean, we we can't just say shellfish are going to clean the environment. They're going to clean the environment. They're going to help, and they're going to especially make the water clear. 
because they filter out everything. But if it's a polluted environment, they will clean the water. But, you know, obviously you can't eat them. And I don't know how long it, it would take. Over time, with no addition of pollution from the land, you know, these areas will will be restored. But even if in a polluted area, if you can develop a habitat, it will improve the entire environment. Where are some of these projects? Well, actually, in the Hudson River, and they're working with, you know, there's different shellfish that aren't eaten by people. Rib mussels in particular are incredible filter feeders and, and natural filters. And they're experimenting with them, actually, in the East River with the idea that they can, in fact, clean up the water. So in very polluted areas, the idea is to try to work with some species that aren't consumed by humans, so there'd be less chance of you know any of these polluted animals getting into the market. Right. And I mean, there's, there's very, very strict regulations with regard to shellfish harvest. And Alex can talk about the amount of paperwork he has to fill out and you know, if anybody ever gets sick on a shellfish or an oyster, it can immediately be traced. There's a paper trail right to where the problem is and the area gets shut down. So, but still, if you in fact have a lot of oysters in an area that's polluted, it is kind of like a tempting situation for somebody who is unscrupulous and would harvest them and try to sell them. But the way the laws are set up, it'd be very difficult for those to get onto the market. Alex, talk about the food culture of oysters. I mean, you said that mostly people are eating them raw, but there's a really extensive historical and current food culture around oysters. Yeah, very much. And it's it's actually something that I, I think there's a lot of room for expansion. Many of us in the know will bring home oysters to grill them or broil them. Uh, oyster stew is one of my absolute favorites. But that really goes to chefs and to expanding out different ideas. One of the impediments is an oyster needs to be shucked. It's got to be opened, you know, while alive in the shell, which is not hard, but it does take learning how to do. There's been some great demonstrations and things here of teaching people how to do that. But there's actually a ways around that. If you you can take a, a whole oyster and put it on the grill or in the broiler, and in a few seconds, really, it will pop itself open and then you can do lots of different things with it. There used to be a market for shucked oysters sold by the jar or by the gallon even, which seems to be less so. I, I would say that, you know, what used to be an incredibly popular street food and common snack for all sorts of folks has definitely grown into more of a... I don't want to say luxury, but kind of a specialty food. It's also something that's aesthetically very pleasing. It's kind of a different experience. You know, a shrimp cocktail is a shrimp cocktail is a shrimp cocktail. But with an oyster on the half shell, there's different sauces and ways to prepare. So it's very much a, it's very much a raw bar experience now. But I think people are missing out on some of the other joyous ways and delicious ways of, of consuming oysters. And historically, they were a food that was eaten by every single social class, like across the social economic spectrum. Poorest people were going out and harvesting oysters. The richest people were eating them in fancy restaurants in New York. It's, it's an interesting food in that way. Mm-hmm. There were oyster stalls like hot dog stands on every corner in New York for many, many years and Boston and many major cities. Yeah. Well, so, there were so many, so many wild oysters at that point before they were overfished and the populations collapsed. You know, it was a very plentiful product. So as a result, it would be cheaper. And now most of what's eaten is grown by private growers. And, and again, the half shell is really, you know, that half shell market is where they can get the most money per animal. So until probably the wild beds are brought back to a situation where they're again so plentiful that they can be harvested at a higher rate. It's unlikely that it's going to be, you know, a food that's cheap enough for everybody. But unfortunately, I mean, it should be when you think about the world population and food, 
shellfish mussels in particular, but even oysters are probably the most efficient forms of animal protein. All other things being equal, it's the best thing that we could be doing for the earth is to be eating low on the food chain and eating oysters. How do we get it to a point where it's available for everybody? Sure. I mean, one thing, Rick, to to back that up is even other fin fish aquaculture, be it salmon, tilapia, tuna, whatever, they need to feed those fish with other species, sardines or things that consume an incredible amount of resources. Oysters essentially don't take anything away from the environment there's no detriment and we don't have to we don't have to tap into any other resources to grow oysters. So that's a huge benefit. And it's something I know that's a big detriment to other kinds of aquaculture that seems on its face, you know, very beneficial of not harming wild stocks, but at the same time there is a cost because those fish have to be fed. And oysters are quite nutritious. Oh, yeah, they're they're the perfect food. They are. They're perfect nutritionally. They're perfect, you know, in terms of being earth friendly. They're loaded with loaded with omega threes, protein, good fats, zinc, good minerals. There's oysters are really good for you. Hey, Rick, one thing I wanted to ask is, haven't there been some thoughts that having found big shell middens in places like South Africa, that it may have been consumption of shellfish that helped human brains develop? Oh yeah, there's a there's an interesting paper by uh, um, I wish I could remember his name. He's an archaeologist out of the University of Arizona, and they've done some work in some caves in South Africa. And some of the theories that are being kicked around is that what happened was there was some climate issues, and, and the human population as a whole, which was located well, actually it wasn't even human yet; it was pre-human populations, were in Africa and the climate changed, it became colder and drier, and essentially there was a lack of food for this, these populations. And as they moved to the coast and they started to eat shellfish and other marine critters, that the omega-3 in that food actually helped to develop better brains. And on top of it, they had to learn a little bit about the tides. And, and so essentially shellfish saved the pre-human race and pretty much made us human. It's it's a great story, and I think there's a lot of truth to it. And then if you look at the shell middens all over the place, that shellfish have been eaten by the human race for like a really long time. As I say, it saved us way back then, and considering all the things we're up against now environmentally, they're one of the things that may save us in our present situation. Alex, what do you love most about oyster farming and what's the most challenging? I'll start with the second first. It has all of the inherent difficulties of any kind of farming. I I now have a lot more respect for strawberry farmers and, and broccoli farmers. You're very much at the whim of weather and natural events. Um, One difficulty we have is that most of our work takes place in salt water, which is not a hospitable environment to equipment, et cetera. And even though the regulations that Rick spoke about are onerous, they're necessary. For example, when we harvest oysters during the summertime, within one hour of coming out of the water, they must be surrounded by two inches of ice. And that is to keep the consumer safe. That, and that is just part of the business. But it's, it's onerous and difficult. It's hard hauling around a few hundred pounds of ice every day. But I'd say to the benefits, I lay my head on my pillow knowing that I'm working on something that is not detrimental to the environment, that's in fact beneficial. It's a thrill to sell or share or give away oysters to friends and and get a text back a couple hours later saying, oh my goodness, those were amazing. Thank. It's a celebratory product, which is something that, you know, people will do for an anniversary or a party, but it also, I live on the water. I'm, I'm surrounded by the ocean every day, but for people who don't have that benefit, 
it's like an instant connection to the sea. And you often hear people say, oh my goodness, it tastes like the sea and it just brings me back to being on the beach or something. And, and also the camaraderie, I have to say. I'm used to tough, competitive fishermen and instead the oyster growers all always help each other out, support each other, help fix broken equipment, give tips, ideas, and, and that collaborative spirit is great. But but I'd say probably the greatest benefit is knowing that I'm working locally, making a few bucks, certainly, but helping a local environment and not causing any detriment to the environment. I want to thank you so much for being with us on Down to Earth. Is there anything that either one of you wants to add? I'll eat more shellfish. <laughs> eat more shellfish is right. <laughs> Eat more shellfish. They're delicious and healthy and you're helping the earth. And it's a wide, beautiful world. I, there's, there's some really great resources out there about different farms and varieties and the different flavors. Boy, Rick, those Nantucket oysters are something else. I hate to tip my cap over there, but they do an amazing job. And, exactly. and, that's, and that's exciting. It's, I have friends who have them in Rhode Island, in Connecticut, and it connects to a community. You're helping local farmers, fishermen, and aquaculturists, and they just, they taste great and they're great for you. I, I like to think of aquaculture, especially of shellfish, as like an evolution from the wild fishery to mm -hmm. actually growing your own and having control over things. So it's essentially, uh, it's like the green revolution. This is a blue revolution with regard to food. And shellfish, and in particular oysters and mussels, they're just the food of the future. And it's really, like I said, we probably were saved before by shellfish, and I think we're going to be saved again. Thank you so much, Alex and Rick, for being with us. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Rick Carney is a shellfish biologist and director emeritus of Martha's Vineyard Shellfish Group. Alex Friedman is owner of Snows Point Oyster Farm. I've put links in the show notes to further resources about oysters and the kind of work that's going on there. So check it out. And many thanks to Sam Hayes for his contribution to this program. You've been listening to Down to Earth. We would love it if you would support this program, which you can do by going to patreon.com slash down to earth planet to plate, where you can sign up for as little as $3. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And also, please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The Kivira Coalition is a not-for-profit and a community network of ranchers, farmers, conservationists, scientists, educators, and many others dedicated to regenerative practices that produce healthy food, support meaningful livelihoods, sustain biodiversity, and remedy the impacts of climate change. To learn more about Kivira and how you can support their work, Visit KiviraCoalition.org, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. And finally, this show is a production with the Radio Cafe. You can check out RadioCafe.org to hear back episodes of this show and also find all kinds of other shows on a wide variety of topics as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>